So springs are fun, but uh, they can be quite tricky to use. Uh, most of my machines have got springs in somewhere. Um, so this video is about uh, how I've managed to use them. I'm not a spring expert, um, but uh, I have been using them for a long time. If you want to skip to a particular chapter, um, here are the contents. So basics, uh, some materials are springy, and more springy than others, or more elastic. So this is a little strip of lead. Uh, even this is a little bit springy, but if you put any force on it, it just flops over. Lead does not make a good spring. Um, aluminium, that's a little bit better, but that's already starting to bend. Not really much better. This is a bit of a laminate. Uh, that's a bit better, but not really very good. It's brittle. That's another thing that can happen to uh, uh, materials. Um, wood. Well, wood varies. Uh, this is chipboard. A little bit of, little bit of bend there, but really not very. <laughs> Again, too brittle, really. Uh, This is just a bit of ordinary wood, uh, but it has, has got it's got a knot in halfway up, so I don't quite know what this will do. I haven't practiced this. Uh, oh, that's not bad actually. Yes, it broke on the knot. So uh, for wood to be any good as a spring, uh, it has to be fairly straight grained. So this this bit is, and that's pretty good. So if you imagine it like the bottom of beds, they're very often uh, just wooden slats um, and, and have a sort of comfortable springiness to them. So, and of course, old fashioned longbows were just, um, were wooden too. Then there's rubber, very springy material. Um, I like this bungee cord stuff. Uh, if you look inside, uh, it's just little strips of uh, natural rubber with this woven casing. Um, I, I like it for prototypes. It's very quick to use to get a, a feel of uh, um, what sort of force you need. Uh, but at least with natural rubber, uh, it's not really good for permanent things um, because it uh, perishes. Uh, this old catapult, um, you can see it starting to perish on, on the ends. But really today, most springs are made of steel. Well, or this is just a bit of mild steel. And yes, it looks springy, but it's not really that much better than the aluminium. It's very easily uh, just deforms permanently, uh, called plastic deformation. Um, but if so spring steel steel made for springs is, is a sort of alloy there's a little bit of carbon and quite often a bit of manganese added as well so this is spring steel <laughs> and it does go back to um, almost exactly where it's well exactly where it started from so uh, the simplest uh, springs are just strips of uh, material usually spring steel um, and of course strips springs like this are quite widely used uh, in locks but also the leaf springs in cars there's general, generally sort of three of them which I think makes them get progressively harder as, uh, as they're more loaded uh, though actually my transit van just has a single leaf on the back wheels just like this but uh, I think the classic spring what people generally think of as a spring is the coil spring and these coil springs, uh, expansion springs, are the springs that I use much more often than any other sort. They're very easy to make really. You start off with uh, some uh, spring steel wire, um, which I can make into a spring on my lathe.
Now, now I've just got to form the ends. Uh, I'll do this one a bit more neatly. Not the neatest ends, but probably would do. Of course, the Chinese now have a much more sophisticated way of making springs. So I've got a nice big spring here and unstretched it's uh, about 250 millimeters long nine and a half inches imperial sort of thing so now I've attached um, a 15 kilogram weight to it uh, to the spring I'm going to see if I can get it over the hook There we go, and now the length of the spring is about 330. Another one of these monstrous 15 kilo Whew, That was a bit of a struggle. So now we've got two of those weights and the elongation is so it's now 420 so the elongation is just about twice as much so basically you've got twice the load and uh, twice the extension and this is a kind of a basic uh, rule about springs um, often called Hooke's law after the scientist Robert Hooke um, that the elongation is proportional to the load uh, and of course this is how spring balances work so um, if I just pull the hand off that take the dial off so you can see inside um, now I should be able to put the pointer back so if I pull now You can see the uh, teeth there and if I turn this up at an angle you can see in here there's a little gear with a white gear in there and you can see how that rotates as the pulling the teeth and of course spring balances come in all shapes and sizes pirate practice actually weighs people Right down in the bottom here, uh, there's a linear actuator and uh, two powerful springs. So when you get on the machine, sitting on the seat, uh, the linear actuator starts moving and stretching the spring until it gets to a point where it's balancing my weight. So then my seat starts to lift up. And when it gets to about halfway, it reaches a sensor which tells the linear actuator to stop. So the stretch of the spring is proportional to my weight. And the brilliant thing about this is that it enables people of completely different weights to race evenly with each other. So another basic property of uh, springs is that they have a sort of natural resonant frequency so um, if I just tap this at the right sort of moment a bit like sw pushing a kid on a swing um, you can build up quite an amplitude which is quite something with these really heavy weights with very little effort it's a sort of resonant frequency and this varies with the weight so if I take one of these weights off, this is a moment swinging, it's about one and a half seconds. And if I try and take one of these off, oh, and do it again.
it's much much more rapid it's about once a second now so it, it's this natural frequency of springs and weights that uh, uh, pocket watches and wristwatches use mechanical ones um, to keep time so uh, this particular one this is a rather beautiful um, Waltham pocket watch from about 1906. Uh, Waltham were the first company to mass produce um, pocket watches by, uh, by machine tools um, and I think they're particularly beautiful. Uh, anyway inside that's the balance wheel whizzing backwards and forwards there and you can just see the hairspring in there black whizzing backwards and forwards too. Um, underneath is the escape wheel um, and it's this combination of the weight of the balance wheel and the spring that has this natural frequency that makes the watch keep time. While this stuff about natural frequencies is fun it is a bit academic generally for my uses. Inside the machine there's this drum that has the three the two scenes and the starting scene. And the motor is down the bottom here, uh, connected originally by a chain drive, the sprocket here with another sprocket on the bottom. Uh, but I couldn't get it to stop in exactly the right position. So um, I added this wheel on the end of the motor, this rubber wheel, and a spring to push it up against the outside of the drum. So it's a sort of friction drive now. And this stops really, really precisely. Um, choosing a spring. Not always easy to choose the right spring. Um, I mean, I've got quite a box of, of uh, old springs, so I usually just pick one and uh, see what happens. I'm going to use this to try and balance the weight on this arm with a spring as an example. Um, so to balance this weight, I would just sort of get a feel of how much force I need. Um, and then try and find a spring that was suitable. Uh, this one's a bit, had it a bit. Um, but of course you can use catalogues. Uh, there are a lot of very uh, detailed spring catalogues, uh, but they aren't half confusing. I mean, I, um, I do use them uh, <laughs> and I spend quite a long time poring over them when I do. Uh, but even so, I quite often but get the wrong spring. And a friend of mine always buys three, one too stiff and one too weak and hopes that one of the three will be about right. And of course, for any mechanism, you can um, uh, what the force is just with a, a spring balance. So um, in this case, yeah, it's about two and a half uh, kilograms force is, the, is what I'm looking for. But I don't usually buy uh, springs from spring catalogues. I, I just occasionally buy this box of 12 inch continuous length assorted springs and it's a wonderfully good value it's about 40 quid and you get lots and lots of springs um, and they vary widely in how uh, strong they are um, so then you can just sort of play with them and decide mm, that feels that one feels too stiff uh, that one feels really stiff that was definitely not going to be any good So then you have to decide the length of the spring. Um, a short length always feels a lot stiffer than uh, the whole thing. Um, the spring rate or force is needed to make it extend for every millimeter is greater for a short length uh, than a long length. Uh, in relation to this example, um, the advantage of a long spring is that it'll be balanced over a much uh, bigger range uh, than a short spring if I just hold it there firmly uh, because the the force in the springs varying by a bigger percentage over this range 
So for this example, I'll obviously need something uh, a bit longer than that, maybe about that long. I should also say that um, with springs of the same sort of wire size, um, that fat diameter ones will stretch much more easily than tight lit, tight narrow ones. Uh, and also these baggy ones, you can stretch to twice their initial length, whereas the tight ones, you can usually only stretch to about one and a half times their length. And anyway, I sort of plump for a spring out of my spring box and then I have to uh, form the ends to make a loop. So the way I do that, I do it um, in the vise uh, with a pair of electrical pliers. I, I just squash the pliers around the end loop of wire to try and force it away from the main body of the spring a bit like that. Uh, I then try and catch the, this, this loop, this separated loop in the vise, in the, in the corner of the vise. And then get my pliers, oh, that should be quite easy to get. So uh, there's my loop. Sometimes you need to cut these uh, lengths of spring um, and you could use a little Dremel with a grinding disc. They're hard steel so you can't cut it with a hacksaw. Um, I've got a, a Proxon uh, long neck angle grinder which I particularly like. And I should say you have to be careful not to cut into any of the um, windings that you want to keep because this is hard steel um, even the slightest nick can form a weakness which may snap later you don't usually have to go all the way through yeah that's going to break now um, and then of course you need to form the other end in exactly the same way as I formed the first one. So now you have your spring with the two ends. And then, uh, of course, you've got to fix the, the, the bottom end of the spring. Um, and I quite often try to make uh, the bottom end adjustable so that uh, you get exactly what you want to balance it. Um, that's not bad. And that'll sort of reasonably balance it over quite a, a range. I quite often do balance mechanisms to make a lighter load for the motor or to make it move more easily for one reason or another. Mum, you're in the mill. Mm -hmm. I'm in the middle, am I? I'm a bit freaked. Shut the door. It appears to be attacking our craft. As we marvel at the peristalsis of the fish's gullet, beware, the gastric juices are highly caustic and are even now eating through our protective shell. <laughs> It's easy to get a spring a bit wrong. When um, my bath escape underwater invention machine starts leaking, people grab the reverse thrusters lever incredibly hard. It's just a simple thing. There's the spring. 
but it snapped several times. I think the fatal flaw was that the nut on the end tightened up, clamping the end of the spring and this creates a stress point uh, which is where it snaps. I should have known better, the ends of a spring must always be free to move about. Freshly regurgitated and thankful to still be alive. But there is an alternative uh, in many situations for balancing a load, which is to use rather than a spring, not to use a spring at all, um, but to use uh, a counterweight instead. So um, I've prepared this counterweight. Shall I just screw on here? And the great advantage of counterweight, it's, it's just sort of balanced wherever you put it. So it then balances an arm anywhere. This clock I made for London Zoo has a mix of counterweights and springs to balance the various mechanisms. This bird box has a counterweight and so does the bird cage at the front. There wasn't a good place to put counterweights for the toucans, so they're balanced by two long springs. So the advantage of the counterweight is that there's nothing to go wrong. Uh, these springs, they have to be stainless because it's outdoors, and in the cold, when it's really cold, one of them cracked, um, had to replace it. Uh, I never completely trust stainless springs. Uh, I think there's a compromise. Uh, to make the metal stainless, it's not, no longer quite so ideal. Uh, it's free characteristics. Um, so you, you can't stress them so much as a, an ordinary spring. So another sort of uh, common spring is a compression spring. Uh, I don't use these a lot. Um, they're very easy to make. You don't need to buy them really because you can just get an ordinary spring, put it in the vise and stretch it really hard and it won't go back to where it started. Um, but the problem I find with them is that once they get sort of long and thin, when you start compressing them, they, they, they want to buckle. They don't want to just squash in uh, squarely. A lot of uh, compression springs are just sort of for short, fat, squidgy ones because they're much less likely to buckle. Um, if you do want to use a long one, uh, you need to put a rod down the middle. This is an enormous industrial spring, uh, but you can see there's a rod that goes down the mod middle with uh, an outer sleeve that it goes into uh, there. This sort of spring, it's a bit like the spring on the car boots, uh, that, um, <clears throat> but they tend to use these gas springs. Uh, and gas springs are extraordinary because they're so tiny, but the force is, uh, uh, it's, I, I can't squish it up at all. Um, they're full of highly compressed gas, uh, but uh, yeah, 
much more compact than uh, a physical spring of the same force. Well, uh, another variety of compression spring um, is what's called a variable rate spring. So they're like these battery terminals. They're, you can see the shape of the spring is sort of conical. And if you uh, get this right, when you start to squish them up, it's the middle returns that go first. They squish before the outer ones. And that's why it's called a variable rate spring. So a, a spring like this won't obey Hooke's law anymore. Ingenious idea. Of course, bed springs are exactly like that. Well, another sort of spring uh, that avoids um, distorting and buckling uh, is, is a rather pretty spring called a volute spring. You sometimes get these in uh, secateurs. Where is it? There's the volute spring in there. So another sort of spring is a, a clock spring or uh, a torsion spring. And these are actually very common. So just ordinary things like a safety pin is really just a torsion spring. And also a clothes peg. It's got a little spring in the inside there, uh, keeping it closed. But again, like uh, compression springs, I don't use these very often in my machines. Uh, very rarely, in fact. But I think the main reason is they're harder to adjust. So um, uh, an extension spring, um, you can adjust the end stop and do so much with. Uh, the, these, again, are more fiddly for one-off machines, I think. Um, but they are beautiful things. Uh, this is also from a clock. Uh, made from spring steel. This is actually the chime from a clock. Spring steel resonates wonderfully, so... Uh... Lovely um, deep note. Uh, and I should have actually said that uh, a lot of springs, particularly compression springs, uh, make a, a nice noise. One. The other uh, contraption that uses uh, springs like this are old uh, record players, the old wind-up ones, uh, clockwork ones that played the old 78 RPM records. Uh, this is the mechanism of one and inside this barrel here is one humongous spring and when they get to be this big they usually totally enclose the springs because they can be quite dangerous if they just spring out unexpectedly. Um, I'll just uh, try and wind this up a bit. So that's wound now. I'll zoom in a bit on it. So the, uh, this is, would be underneath the uh, record player and that would be the pivot of the turntable under there. So if I now release the brake, it'll start to go. Um, but they have to have a, a, a governor in to keep them whoops, um, going at a constant speed, which is rather a beautiful mechanism in here. Whoops. And that's the speed regulator, is the little knob down here, little lever. Of course, clocks have a, a similar uh, problem. Uh, clock springs um, provide much more force when they're fully wound than when they're nearly unwound. So one traditional, rather beautiful way of coping with this problem, um, it's the right way around to see it, uh, 
is this beautiful thing in here called a fusée. It's a spiral wound groove um, with uh, a gear on the end. Uh, so that's the spring barrel in there and it's connected by steel cable to the fusée. It's fully wound at the moment so it's wrapped around the comes off the smallest part of the fusée but as the clock spring unwinds um, more and more of the cable wraps around uh, the spring drum and eventually it'll be coming off the other end of the fusée much bigger diameter and this has the effect of providing an almost perfectly constant force to the clock escapement. So another sort of spring is uh, constant force springs. So things like this tool balancer will be stable wherever I put it. The spring rate remains the same in any position. So what's going on inside here? Um, it's actually just got a long spring like this um, and seat belt uh, mechanisms are a bit the same. It's just a tightly wrapped coil of uh, spring steel strip uh, that unwinds like that. Well you might think this looks exactly the same as a as a, as a clock spring. Um, but as a clock spring unwinds, um, all the, every different part of the spring is changing its uh, radius. Every bit of the whole spring is contributing uh, to the springiness, if you like, of the whole thing. Um, whereas in these ones, it's so tightly wrapped that this is kind of fixed. So um, when you stretch it out, the only bit that's actually changing at any time is this short section between where it's curved and where it's straight. Once it's straight, it's staying the same, so it's not contributing any force. So it doesn't matter how far you stretch it, um, it's still this little section here that is what's providing the retracting force. And that's why um, it remains constant. Oh, and one last thing about the constant force spring. Um, you might think it's the same as in a tape measure. And in many ways it's very similar. But the tape measure just stays effortlessly straight. It's a very clever, very clever thing. And uh, so this is a very uh, special um, sp sort of spring. It's called a negator spring. Not to be confused with a constant force spring. So this is another sort of spring I like very much. Uh, this is a springy washer called a Belleville washer. If you look carefully you can see they're just very slightly dished. It's not obvious how these washers could be a spring but if you push them together hard they gradually get flatter. So one way of thinking about them is that they are an extra small compression spring. They're just doing that when you compress them. So I use these Belleville washers as torque limiters. So this is a torque limiter um, on this chain drive. Um, according to how tightly I tight up the nut, um, uh, governs, limits the torque. So there it's quite slack. If I tighten the nut up a bit more, so now I can just about push the thing along the table. Uh, if I tighten it up a lot more, um, I'll have to put my hand on it this time to stop. I can still just about stop it. So it's very finely adjustable. So uh, what's inside behind the nut as this lock washer to fix the nut in a particular place then here are the two Belleville washers slightly dished then there's the pulley and the pulley is sandwiched between these two fibre washers like that 
So uh, what it's doing is it's the more I tighten up the nut, the more it's pushing uh, the fiber washers against the pulley. And that's how it uh, controls the torque. But you can make your own. Um, a more simple minded version. Um, so I make up something like this which fixes onto my motor. Uh, then you put a, a washer over the end then your load, in this case a, a V-pulley. Um, another one of those. Then you put your two Belleville washers. Then a flat washer and finally a nut. And again, same sort of thing. It turns quite easily now, but now it sort of started to get quite stiff to turn. Though I often use torque limiters with chain drives uh, for any mechanism that's exposed to the public so that they can't uh, get their fingers stuck uh, or can't hurt their fingers if they do get them stuck in a mechanism, uh, but also if the mechanism itself can get jammed. So uh, this is part of a clock I made for the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Uh, there are eight mechanisms on each side. And if any one of them gets jammed, uh, the motor and everything else will still keep running because it, they've all got these torque limiters. Springs are often used in conjunction with shock absorbers. Uh, in cars, the combination gives a much better ride. With just a spring, you'd be bouncing up and down like crazy. Uh, you can buy smaller shock absorbers. Um, I have to admit, I've never really got into using them much. They're expensive and uh, never quite got a feel of uh, what size you need for what load. Um, but they are good. So on this model here, I've just connected this uh, lever arm with a spring uh, and initially it's just going to land on a steel stop. You wouldn't want to have your finger in there, but it's, it's a, it's a sh big shock load for the mechanism. Um, so uh, if I replace the steel stop now um, with a shock absorber, that'll be a big difference. So now, repeat the experiment. It's just beautiful the way it sort of brings it up to a controlled stop. Oh, and uh, door closers are uh, a good uh, sort of budget form of uh, shock absorber. I've never actually used one on my machines, but I just uh, feel they have a lot of potential. Well, the other reason I don't often use these shock absorbers is because there's a much more simple-minded, cheaper option, which is just these little rubber conical uh, buffers, if you like, stops. Um, so I'll now replace the shock absorber with, one, with this stop. So now repeating the experiment with the conical rubber stop. It's not so graceful, but it does the job. It still brings the things to a stop a lot with a lot less shock. In the Pirate, there's an awful lot of energy in these springs, and particularly when you get really heavy people using it. Uh, so anyway, it needs serious spring stops. I've got two of my rubber cones in there and that stops at the top and an even bigger one for stopping when people bounce down round the back. Well that's the end of this video. I hope you found something interesting or useful in it. Uh, I'm going to leave you with Divorce, another machine of mine that contains lots of springs and dampers. <laughs>